word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our story for today really is a continuation from what took place in chapter 9. It seems that Jesus and the Pharisees were engaged in a very heated argument sparked by Jesus healing a man born blind. I am sure that there are many things that got under the Pharisees' thin skin, but what seemed to be the main issue for this fiery debate was that the healing took place on the Sabbath. It's obvious in the passage that the Pharisees could care less about the man himself. They show no compassion for the man, or do they show amazement at the miraculous healing that has taken place? Instead, you can almost picture them red in the face with anger that Jesus would dare would have the audacity to heal someone on the Sabbath. What mattered most to them was the legality of a healing on the Sabbath, the breaking of the law, and not that a man who was born blind was given a gift of sight. In response, Jesus draws on the vocational metaphor of a shepherd to counter the self-righteous legalism of the Pharisees. And this is where our story begins. First, a word about the shepherds. To be clear, the life of a shepherd was not a particularly glamorous or fun job. It would not have been at the top ten list of the jobs that was most popular or sought out by the people. Being a shepherd could be boring. It meant spending a lot of time away from the family. Shepherds had to deal with the conditions of the weather and animal predators like lions and bears and wolves. They had to deal with human predators as well, such as thieves who came to steal their sheep. Shepherds are among the poorest of the poor. You kind of get where I'm going with this. I hope you get the picture that, and it's interesting that Jesus uses this metaphor to describe his relationship with his followers. In doing so, he places himself firmly in the prophetic tradition that they would be familiar with. From Ezekiel, we read these words. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. They shall lie down in the good grazing lands, and they shall feed on rich pastures in the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the stray. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy." I will feed them with justice. The shepherd image was something that the people were familiar with. It was comforting. We are given a picture of safety and goodness that is similar to what we read this morning in our song reading. The sheep know the shepherd. The shepherd knows his sheep. They trust him, and when he calls out, they recognize his voice. If a stranger came and calls out to them, they would not be fooled. They would not follow, for they do not know the voice of any other but that of the shepherd. Because the shepherd knows his sheep. The shepherd calls them by name. Remember Mary at the tomb? She did not recognize the risen Lord until he said, Mary. And what about Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, when he hears the voice of Jesus commanding him, Lazarus, come out. Our passage for this morning reminds us that sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the shepherd's voice and that of a stranger, except for those who know the voice. 
For those, sometimes there is this unclarity when the distinction is sharp, there is no problem. For example, when one preaches love and another preaches hate, it's easy to know the voice of the shepherd. The problem arises sometimes for folks when it's not so apparent, not so obvious. How do we discern between biblical truths and human ideas, between righteous self and self-righteousness, between evangelism and playing the numbers? How life would be so much simpler if there was such clarity sometimes. But it isn't. But what is clear in this passage is that it gives us a couple of standards for measuring, discerning, whether the one speaking is the shepherd, the one who knows our name, the one who gives us abundant life. As I thought about this, I think at the very top is to know and to be known. That is at the center of our Christian faith. There is no anonymity here. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, and the sheep follow because they know his voice. You see, we don't serve and worship a God who is dispassionate or disconnected from us. Rather, we serve a God who knows us personally and calls us by name, who cares for us, who loves us, who values us, who desires to be in relationship with us. And because of that relationship, we can discern God's voice. Intimacy is a basic human need. It is essential to our well-being. That is one of the studies done, especially as we get older, and they've talked about when you go in to see uh, nursing homes especially, the touch, to touch somebody's hand or shoulder. The gift of intimacy is also necessary for a vibrant, healthy church. Folks want a place where they can be known. I was reminded of, for those who remember, do you remember that show, Cheers? The kind of place where everyone knows your name, where meaningful relationships can be born and nurtured, where someone's story matters, where you matter, where relationships matter. The faith community is shaped by that kind of mutual love that comes to us through God and Christ. Why do you think so many people go to coffee places over and over and over? It's a safe place. They are loved and they are known by name. Church is a place that we come and we greet and love one another. The shepherd and the sheep is built on mutual trust and love. The sheep know the shepherd will look after them and take care of them. They put their very lives, their very being in the shepherd's hand. The shepherd flock is not just one big mass group together, but rather they are known, each one of them. They are precious, and the shepherd cares for all of them. Abundant living is about being relevant, making a difference, being a part of something greater than ourselves, seeing our connection to the whole of creation matters. The church, the faith community, is called to share the good news, to spread the word, the joy, the love, our resources, forgiveness, so that others might come and know and hear the shepherd's voice. We are to be the light that shines brightly so that it might illumine what is going on. As I said earlier this morning, we are once again re-engaging in sure Sarasota United for responsibility and equity, uniting with our brothers and sisters from many faith traditions to stand for issues of justice, to stand for restoration and healing. The council of the session is talking about ways that we can become a welcoming church, a safe haven, a place where all people are known and can be known. Abundant living that is highlighted in our passage involves ministry and mission. This is where meaning and pleasure are found. The abundant life that Jesus is talking about is not in the things or possessions that we own. Jesus didn't come to bring us stuff. Jesus comes to stuff us with healing and wholeness and life abundant. 
In other words, this abundant living is not eye-focused, but rather really outward-focused. Abundant living focuses on God and others. A couple weeks ago, several of us went and worked on a Habitat house, and we found out it's going to a veteran, which kind of made it even more special. I hope that we will continue this. This house is probably going to be worked on for another six months, so I hope that we can get a group and continue to go out perhaps once a month. At least twice a month, workers come here to church to fill food for children, and I'm amazed because I think for some of them, it takes them longer to drive here than it does to fill up the bags, and yet it gives them meaning and pleasure. It's relevant what they're doing. Our Butterfly and Marnock program regularly visits with shut-in because it's meaningful and relative. Our Stevens ministry program supports the folks who find themselves in a difficult situation or perhaps a small crisis in life because they can share the love of God and because it's meaningful and relevant. Supporting Family Promise, Meals on Wells, Bethel, All Faith Food Bank, Children's Pantry, I could go on. People do this because it's meaningful and relevant. Focusing on ministry opens up new possibilities and allows us to live a life in the presence of God. Abundant living is not about all the things that we have or we will get. Abundant living is about so much more. Abundant living is about our relationship with God and all the gifts and the blessings that come from that relationship that give our life meaning and purpose. Abundant living rejoices that one who once was blind can now see. Abundant living is a father running out with open arms to welcome his lost son. Abundant living is opening up your house to a child or youth who needs a place to stay. Abundant living is the table that is set before us that welcomes all to come, no matter who you are, what you have done, because you are loved and you are valued by the shepherd who knows his sheep and by the sheep who knows the voice of the shepherd. For the shepherd speaks grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. That, my friends, is not just good news, but the best news that we could ever hear. Let us pray. Great and holy God, we give you thanks that you have called each one of us by name, that you know every little single hair on our head. You know us as we were knit in our mother's wound, and you love us, and you fill us with your spirit of goodness and grace and mercy. May we be alert and open so that we might hear your voice calling us, And when it says, come, come, may we respond. Amen.